Hi, everybody. Russ Barkley back again. And guess who's making an appearance? The Moose. The Moose, he's having a little bit of bacon here this morning. Hey, Moose has got a Halloween joke for you. It's a dad joke. What do you get when you cross a vampire with a snowman? Frostbite. Ha, ha, ha. Isn't that great? Love those dad jokes. Halloween's coming up. Stay tuned. And there goes the Moose, having told his joke. Uh, another joke for you, if you want. Um, what do you call an... Arrow without an arrowhead. Pointless. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, isn't that great? Uh, double meaning on that one as well. So welcome to this week's research review. Uh, we've got three articles to focus on. All the rest are over in the thumbnail sketch, as always. And again, just a reminder, I don't review animal research, doctoral dissertations, or master's theses that might have been published on the internet somewhere. We're just talking about human research, mainly with a clinical focus. So, uh, okay. Uh, first up is going to be an article that appeared this week in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. Uh, and this is an interesting study on the interaction of peer functioning difficulties with ADHD symptoms over time. They also looked at the symptom of irritability as well. Uh, and uh, what's interesting about this is that they found that there was, in fact, a significant interaction. Let's take a look at this. This was a study, as you can see here, a uh, rather sizable one, actually, of 739 children between the ages of 8 and 11. And again, about half of them were female, which is always good to see. Uh, and they were assessed at three different time points six months apart. Uh, so very important there. And they were evaluated using rating scales, uh, parent reports, and so on, uh, of not only ADHD symptoms, but uh, children's irritability as well. Uh, and then they were assessing peer functioning uh, using a what's called a peer nomination technique, which is where you go in and interview the other friends or other peers, I should say, of these individuals and get them to nominate most liked, least liked, and uh, uh, children who are, in fact, might even be rejected. So, uh, so a very nice study done here, longitudinal study. And what it found, as it says here, is that the longitudinal network analysis that they did showed that poor peer functioning did contribute to increases in symptoms over this 18-month uh, period, over the three time points of assessment. Specifically, they found that uh, physical victimization predicted increases in all ADHD symptoms, inattention, hyperactivity, along with irritability. Peer rejection predicted increases in inattention only, but that in turn later on predicted an increase in irritability. Peer acceptance, on the other hand, predicted a decrease in the inattention and irritability symptoms. Finally, they found that higher numbers of mutual friendships uh, seemed to increase inattention for some reason uh, inexplicable here. But overall, I thought the gist of the article is that how ADHD children and teens are accepted by their peers or rejected by them or even victimize them may have some influence on fluctuating levels of their ADHD symptoms and their proneness to irritability. So uh, overall, I thought a very interesting finding that had really not been explored previously in the literature to my knowledge. The second paper that's up here is a review of other reviews and a meta-analysis on the role of exposure to environmental pollutants and levels of ADHD symptoms or prevalence of ADHD, depending on how it was measured. Uh, this article appeared over in the journal Environmental Science and Pollution Research. Uh, and being a review of reviews, as you know, I like these meta-analyses because they go and they collect all of the research put it through a screen for what's the more rigorous studies, what studies should be ignored, because they're not very rigorous, uh, and then collect the data from the individuals and uh, individual studies, that is, and combine them. So uh, here, uh, they've done several things. First, they've looked at other reviews, at other meta-analyses, and then they conducted their own analysis as well. And their goal was to answer questions with regard to the extent to which various environmental pollutants 
may have some effect on ADHD diagnosis and symptoms. So, as you see here, they found 1,800 studies in the literature. Interesting. However, most of those were so bad that only 14 studies qualified to be eligible for their review and analysis. Now, their review found evidence of a significant role for some pollutants, particularly uh, heavy metals, such as lead, and mercury and others, and phthalates. Phthalates are chemicals that are used in plastics, usually to make them a harder uh, material, uh, but they are ubiquitous in the environment, as you know, as is plastic. Uh, and there appeared to be some significant relationship between these pollutants and ADHD symptoms or percent of diagnosis. Now, uh, what it found, of course, is that the influence, although statistically significant, isn't very large. As we know, the majority of ADHD is the result of genetic factors, but that doesn't mean that a small percentage of cases or a small exacerbation in ADHD symptoms might not be occurring with some of these pollutants. Uh, other pollutants were not found to be linked to ADHD uh, diagnosis or symptoms, but those two categories of pollutants appear to maybe have some relationship. We need to, I guess, do further research, as those of us in research often say. So um, overall, a very nice review of a very important issue concerning the effect of pollutants on ADHD. Lastly, we're going to have a look at another meta-analysis. Surprise, surprise, Russ likes these kinds of uh, papers because they give us more robust findings than an individual paper might give us. This one, interestingly, is on the role of repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. So they take a device, it's like a magnet, and they place it at various parts over the head, and it transmits a magnetic wave into the brain, stimulates the brain, uh, and it's believed that in doing so, it might help to activate or even reset some brain neural networks and brain regions so that maybe they function better. That's at least the theory behind the use of this technique. And although it has been studied in a number of small individual papers, the results of those papers are all over the map. Uh, some finding no effect whatsoever, some finding a certain extent of effect, uh, some finding that one trial doesn't seem to matter, but repetitive stimulation of the brain might be helpful. This particular review concentrated on measures that were uh, from psychological or laboratory tests. So here's a, a review that appeared over in BMC Psychiatry, and let's go down and take a look at what they found. Uh, overall, in their meta-analysis, they found only five good randomized controlled trials of this kind of stimulation, meaning that people were randomly assigned to either get the treatment or to get a placebo or to get no treatment, uh, and then they compared these groups with each other. So uh, they had uh, about five articles involving 189 participants. Some were adults, average age 32 or so. Uh, some were kids at around eight years of age. And what they found overall is that repetitive TMS, as it's called, was more effective at improving sustained attention on tests with those with ADHD compared to the control groups that did not get the treatment. They did some secondary analyses and found that this repetitive TMS treatment seemed to be more effective at improving processing speed on psychological tests, but was not effective in enhancing working memory or executive functioning or other tests. So a very limited impact of this treatment on these measures. Uh, what I found telling about this review is they didn't look at self or other reports of ADHD symptoms out there in the real world. They didn't look at functioning out there in the real world. They didn't look at executive functioning specifically in daily life as measured by executive function rating scales. Uh, and they didn't look at levels of impairment. So uh, we would refer to this study or this review as focusing on what's called near transfer. 
you got the treatment in the lab, we gave you some psychological tests in the lab, and we then looked at whether the treatment improved those psychological tests. Interesting, but meh. What we really want to know is, is far transfer. Does this treatment affect people's lives, either in reducing symptoms in the real world, improving executive functioning in the real world, or reducing impairment in the real world? And this review simply can't help us do that, largely because some of the studies that they looked at didn't do it either. So not an awful lot of measures of far transfer out there. Stay tuned. Maybe this treatment has some promise for ADHD. Maybe it doesn't. These psychological tests suggest a, some degree of improvement. But overall, still a long way to go before we recommend this in clinical practice. So, all right, there's your research review for this week. Thanks for joining me again. Uh, please recommend us to others, as I often admonish you to do. Um, subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed already. Uh, I'm usually putting out material, oh, every two to three days on various topics. Uh, and uh, also, I hope you'll join us later in the week for other videos. And thanks again for being a subscriber to my channel. Take care, everybody, and I'll see you on the next review. Bye.